Okay, we're talking about legged locomotion this morning. Uh, we were just talking about the relationship between the energetics of movement, uh, walking and uh, running, the energetics of movement and gait uh, and speed of travel. Okay, so uh, it's interesting that there is not this continuum between walking and running. You walk for a while and then at some point you switch to this gait. You'll remember from last week our discussion about uh, active categorical perception that because of our interactions with the world, there is something about that inter interaction that causes the analog or continuous world around us to collapse into concrete categories. We saw the example of manipulating an object where if you're manipulating on a table, uh, certain objects will roll under your hand and then as they become more edged or less like a sphere, they will start to slide along the table. Same thing happens with our own body, which is obviously a set of physical objects uh, in the world. Um, so again, we see the almost magical appearance of categories in a continuous world when we have an embodied agent, in this case, legged mammals, interacting with their environment. Okay, there's lots of other interesting relationships between energy and efficiency and speed of travel and stability. Here's just one more uh, case. Here again, uh, they, have, uh, they have a bunch of ma human male uh, subjects. And in this case, uh, in this case, they uh, asked the subjects to walk with uh, different kinds of walking gates. Uh, this was all, all these gates were done at 1.5 meters per square, um, sorry, 1.5 meters per second on the treadmill. In one case, they asked the subjects to walk with very small steps, which requires the subject to take lots more steps per unit time to stay on the 1.5 meter per second traveling treadmill. So take lots of fast, small steps. Or they asked the subjects to take very long, loping strides. So the horizontal axis here is stride frequency measured in hertz. So what this ends up being is the number of steps taken per second. So the number of strides per second, hertz is uh, oscillations per second. And you'll notice that uh, for very long loping strides, it's energy inefficient. And for taking lots of fast, small steps, it is also energy inefficient. For these particular adult human male subjects, the most comfortable walking um, way of walking at 1.5 meters per second was to take about one step per second. As you're walking around your apartment, uh, get out your, your phone and uh, watch the second hand on the clock and time yourself as you walk naturally around your environment. Steps are a little bit different, as long as you're traveling over flat ground. You will find that for most of us, you take about one step per second uh, as well. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's introduce a little bit of terminology that's specific to legged uh, locomotion. We've already introduced uh, gates. Let's switch and talk about horses for a moment. Uh, horses have uh, depending on how you count, four or five uh, gates. Here are three of them, walking, trotting, and, and galloping. Any horse people uh, in the audience today? What are the other gates that we're missing? No horse people this morning? So running is, uh, running is another one, cantering, yep. Yeah. Great. Yep. Missy and Logan. That's right. Um, uh, again, for the non-horse people out there, um, the Icelandic, uh, there's an Icelandic breed of, of horse that actually is capable of exhibiting a sixth gait, which is kind of interesting within more or less the same uh, species. Um, Within different groups, like the Icelandic horses, there's a fifth one. It's called a tulting. Uh, the O should have an umlaut on it. I don't know how to type umlauts in uh, Teams uh, chat. Uh, after this lecture, you can go, uh, you can go uh, check out on YouTube uh, tulting I Icelandic horses. It's, it's clearly very different from the other five uh, gates. Okay, so 
Um, in a legged, uh, in a legged animal or a legged robot, as we'll see shortly, we can talk about the stance phase and the flight phase. So any gait, by definition, is an oscillation, meaning that the animal or the uh, robot is going to return to the same pose at certain points in time. We were just talking about human walking. You return to the same uh, gait. You return to the same uh, pose every second. Left, right. Left, right, left, right. Okay. During one iteration of the gate, so before, as you're going from uh, one pose and returning to that pose through an oscillation, you can ask what fraction of that uh, iteration is the stance phase in which you have at least one foot on the ground. You can also ask for a particular gait whether there is a flight phase. Is there any fraction in the oscillation of that gait in which none of the feet are on the ground? Uh, obviously for legged uh, animals as they move faster and we move into high speed uh, high speed gates like galloping, cantering uh, and running, you can see that there clearly are uh, flight phases. Um, in walking uh, in walking for uh, horses and for humans, they always have or we always have at least one foot on the ground. Trotting was, for a long time, it wasn't so obvious from watching a horse trotting whether there was actually a very short period of time in which all four feet came off the ground. Um, if, you, if there's any film studies students here, the very, very first film or animated, uh, animated set of images that was produced was of a trotting horse to try and determine whether there was a flight phase or not. Uh, if you watch the animal, it's hard to tell. So wouldn't it be great if you use this brand new emerging technology of moving pictures to create a moving picture of a horse and then watch individual frames from those moving pictures and slow down that sequence of moving images to determine whether there was a, a, a flight phase. Again, go Google that. It's a great, it's a the great history uh, of film and biomechanics. Okay, so that's uh, stance and flight phase. Here's uh, here's kind of a cool GIF that I just pulled uh, off the web that shows the same thing for large uh, large dogs. Okay. A little bit more uh, terminology. We're going to talk about static and dynamic uh, stability. Uh, static stability um, is the idea that if during a particular gait the animal or the robot suddenly becomes static, stops moving, will the animal fall over? Um, during walking uh, for horses or humans, if you stop at a given moment in time, most of the time you're statically stable. If you immobilize yourself during the phase of walking while you have both feet on the ground, obviously you can maintain your balance. If you're on one foot during walking, you can't always, you're not always necessarily statically stable. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Obviously, you can shift your center of mass, so you're over your stance foot, the foot that's on the ground, and now you'll be statically stable. But if your center of mass is away from your foot horizontally, you're not necessarily, you're, you, you're going to fall over. This is how we determine static and static stability is by looking at the polygon of support. So if you take a horse or a human and you imagine points in time during the gate, you can, for a given point in time, you can ask the question, how many, if any, feet are on the ground? In this cartoon example down here, I'm assuming we have a four-legged animal like a horse. At this point in time, it's left foot, left back foot, and right back foot are on the ground, and its right front foot is off the ground. If we were to reach down with chalk and draw a polygon around the horse's uh, stance feet at that time, we would have this triangle. If the horse was running on a treadmill where we were able to measure the weight of the horse uh, at, that, at that time, or if we were able to measure the amount of pressure on each of these three feet, we could work out the center of mass of the horse. If the center of mass is within the polygon of support and that animal becomes immobile, it is statically stable. 
Again, in the comfort of your own home, you can practice this later today as you're walking around at random points in time, stop moving and see whether you maintain your balance or whether you start to fall over. And you should be able to sense in those moments whether your center of mass was over your polygon of support uh, or not. Okay, a little more tricky one is dynamic stability. This is, this is possible with physical systems where systems are in motion and if they're perturbed while they're in motion, they happen to return to their, uh, their they, they return to the oscillation that they were performing. One way to think about this, some of you may have performed this experiment in science class, is if you take a bicycle wheel and you hold uh, the either axles and you spin the wheel and you try and tilt the wheel, a very quickly moving uh, circle will resist your attempts to perturb it, to, uh, to turn the wheel. If you hold a stationary bicycle wheel and tilt it, obviously it will tilt with you. A stationary single bicycle wheel has no dynamic stability, but a fast spinning bicycle wheel will, is dynamically stable. It will resist your attempts to perturb it. Same thing with locomotion. With your brain, you can sense a perturbation and alter the way you move to, uh, to recover from that perturbation. But in some cases, you don't need to think about it at all. You will just passively return to, your, to the way you were moving before. Okay, we'll see some examples of that in a moment. Uh, here's another example of, uh, I'm just changing the polygon of support. So in our hypothetical horse down here, assume that it's the right back leg has come off the ground. Now the polygon of support is much more narrow. If the center of mass is more or less under the belly of the horse, the horse is gonna start to tip over to its uh, right. Okay. Here's another plot that is more or less like the one uh, that we saw earlier. This is now with ponies rather than with uh, humans. These ponies were trained. We can't tell the ponies to do certain things, so we're going to have to train them to do certain things. They were trained to, uh, they were put on a much larger treadmill, and that treadmill was run at very different speeds. And uh, if, the, uh, if the pony, for example, uh, would usually gallop when the treadmill was going at six or seven meters per second, at, uh, at four or less meters per second, the pony would sort of instinctually like to slow down to a trot. But if the pony happened to maintain the gallop as the treadmill was slowing down, the pony was given a carrot. So it was trained to exhibit uh, these gates at different speeds. And you'll notice that it, we can train a pony to gallop to continue galloping at speeds that are slower, it can resist the instinct to change to trot if it keeps getting carrots, if it continues galloping. But by doing so, it's using much more energy than it normally would. So by doing this with lots of different ponies at lots of different speeds on the treadmill, you can train the ponies to do it and you get these different power curves. And we can see that there are energy minima. So we can can get a pony to walk at different speeds, but it uses the least energy when it's walking at a little more than one meter per second on the treadmill. Same thing for trotting and galloping. So we can produce these curves. Then we can watch normal ponies, untrained ponies, doing their things in their, in their paddock, just by eye. And if we have a, a speed camera, we can measure how fast they're moving as they move around in the paddock. We'll notice that they tend to travel at three non-overlapping speeds. And at those speeds, they either walk, trot, or gallop. Given this lead up, it may not be surprising to you that they are performing those different gates at those different speeds, which are at the energy minima. Okay. Okay, we've been talking a lot about uh, mammalian legged locomotion. I found this uh, on Twitter a few months back and absolutely had to show it in our lecture on biomechanics. This is just a reminder that in nature there are no hard and fast rules. Here's another example of legged locomotion, obviously not in a mammalian uh, species. Pretty stable. This animal is not likely to fall over. 
Um, I don't know how energy efficient this is. Obviously, uh, moving in this environment is not the natural habitat for this particular species, but it definitely is possible. It's using a lot of energy and it's stable, but it's a little bit more robust or it's a lot more robust than many of us originally thought. Apparently, this species is able to move perfectly fine uh, in an environment that it wasn't originally evolved for. Good old octopi, they, they, uh, they're always the exception to every rule in biomechanics and animal behavior you can think of. Okay, so let's switch now from uh, animals to uh, robots. And legged locomotion has uh, long been a goal in, uh, in robotics. This is why we're talking about legged locomotion in our history segment uh, of the course. Most of you are probably familiar with Big Dog uh, now. Um, Big Dog was originally revealed to the world, I think it says updated in March 2010. I think it was around 2010 when the Big Dog video was released. This was a huge deal at the time. Everything that had come before Big Dog uh, was very, uh, performed legged locomotion poorly. The biggest challenge for legged locomotion in robotics is not speed or energy efficiency, it's stability. It's extremely difficult to progr program a robot to keep from falling down. Some of you might want to pursue this idea in your, uh, in your final project. Um, some of you are probably familiar with the original uh, or the most recent Big Dog videos. This was the first one. Uh, hopefully most of you can hear the buzzing of the uh, diesel engine that's running uh, this robot. So this robot is definitely not energy efficient, but it is stable. It's able to walk um, and it's relatively robust. It's able to walk over many different uh, environments. And it has also been programmed to be, uh, to, be so, to um, recover from perturbations. So it is dynamically stable in a sense. It's not, in, it's not intrinsically dynamically stable like the bicycle wheel we talked about. It's got a lot of programming to know how to recover from perturbations, but it is able to do so. Here it is walking on an, here it is walking on an icy surface. It's carrying about 325 pounds in these bags. Um, I don't recommend you trying the, the same thing. Right. So this is actually superhuman ability. It's able to exhibit legged locomotion in a way that would be difficult or impossible for for humans. OK, that was the first uh, big dog video. Here is the second one. This is big dog beta. Some of you may have seen this video or not. What's the difference between the second video and the first video? Big dog beta seems to be pretty safe when it's in close proximity to humans or dogs. It's also able to recover from perturbations. It looks happy. Very Breitenberg thing to say, Missy. Yeah, looks, looks happy. It doesn't quite recover in this case. What's the difference between big dog beta and big dog alpha? It's two, as Andrew says, we've got two uh, bipeds here that are having a good time and uh, spoofing, uh, spoofing big dog. You know you've made it big in robotics when you get a, a spoof video. Okay, I'll leave you to watch the rest of the big dog uh, beta video. Okay, so uh, we're going to switch now and look at um, one of my uh, early research papers. Um, and uh, this was some work I did with Rolf Pfeiffer. What we tackled in the, what the research question that we tackled in this paper was, what is the relationship between legged locomotion and body plan? We've looked at horses, dogs, ponies, humans, big dog, big dog, alpha. They all have different bodies. And as we already know for different, oh, and we've looked at octopi, uh, as we know now, these different species or these different animals have different comfortable ways of walking. Um, they have different gaits and different species have different gates. 
What is the relationship between gait and energy efficiency and body plan? That is a harder question to answer. So Rolf and I tackled this question by creating 10 different simulated robots. As you can see, obviously, they all have different body plans. But we tried to keep everything else about these robots the same. You'll notice in each of these 10 panels, you should notice that there are four A's. These are four angle sensors or four proprioception se sensors. Angle and proprioception uh, are often uh, synonymous when we're talking about uh, uh, rotational joints. You'll notice also that there are four T's in each panel. These are the four touch sensors. So each robot has four angle sensors and four uh, touch sensors, so a total of eight sensors. And you'll notice eight M's in each of the panels corresponding to eight motors. So despite the differences in bodies, each robot has exactly the same number of sensors and motors and exactly the same number of sensor neurons and motor neurons. Each robot has eight sensor neurons and each robot has eight motor neurons. They also have exactly the same neural network. So this is a, a normal neural network, not a CTRNN anymore. We have our input layer up here, our sensor layer down here. We have our output or motor, our eight motor neurons down here. Sorry, these are our eight sensor neurons, eight motor neurons. You'll notice in this case that I included three hidden neurons. You'll notice that each sensor neuron is connected by a synapse to each hidden neuron. You'll notice that each hidden neuron is connected to each motor neuron. And you'll notice that all of the hidden neurons are also connected to each other and to themselves. Okay. You'll notice one additional detail here, which are two neurons called B1, uh, B, B1 and B2. These are bias neurons. Um, we saw bias before when we talked about uh, when we talked about CTRNNs. The bias neurons always output a value of 1.0, no matter what's happening. Why did I why did I include a bias neuron uh, at the input layer here? What do you think might be the advantage of a bias neuron? Feel free, if you have an idea, feel free to type it into chat or unmute yourself and offer an opinion. As you can imagine, I use an evolutionary algorithm to evolve weights for every single synapse you see in this picture. What's the advantage of a bias neuron? No. It's possible, depending on what your sensors are, it's, it's possible that all eight values uh, approach, uh, all eight values are close to or equal to zero. In the touch sensors you're working with in this course, the touch sensors are never zero. They're always uh, either minus one or plus one. But in this experiment, the touch sensors could be zero or one. And the angle, the angle of the joint can also be zero as well. If the robot receives no input from the sensor values, if most or all of the sensor neurons are close to or equal to zero, then it doesn't really matter what the values of the synaptic weights are. The hidden neurons are going to be close to or equal to zero, and the motor neurons are going to be close to or equal to zero. Imagine a robot that jumps off the ground, so it now has no touch information at all. And imagine the joints are all relatively close to their default or initial settings, which is zero radians. The only thing that robot can do is freeze in midair. There's no other options available to it. However, if one of its neurons at the input layer is always one, then evolution can tune the weights of these synapses to make sure that the robot does some, something, does something in particular, if it's useful, when all of its incoming sensory information is close to zero. Okay. Um, we added a second bias neuron for good measure at the, uh, at the hidden layer as well.
Okay, not too important for our purposes, but just for the sake of completeness, we've now talked about all sorts of kinds of uh, neurons in neural networks. Okay, uh, so as I mentioned, we kept uh, the sensors and we kept everything the same except the body. I did, uh, I ran 30 evolutionary trials of evolving sets of synaptic weights for this robot. So that this neural network exists in this robot, same neural network, same architecture exists in this robot. They all have the same neural network architecture, but I evolved different sets of synaptic weights for these different robots. I performed 30 evolutionary runs for this robot in which the fitness function was speed of forward travel, just like in your assignments. I did another 30 evolutionary runs of evolving sets of synaptic weights for this robot to maximize forward trial. This one, this one, this one, this one, this one. The end of the experiment, we had a total of 300 evolutionary runs. I could look across these sets of, of evolutionary runs and ask the question, which evolutionary algorithm was able to extract the most speed from that robot? What, what was it about the body of that robot that allowed it to move faster? I'm gonna show you the results in a moment. Um, obviously you have access to the slide deck yourself, so don't cheat by uh, flipping ahead. Uh, I want you to type into chat a number from one to 10 about which robot you think at the end of this experiment traveled the fastest on average. Go ahead and, and type in your guesses now. Okay, we have one vote for robot number two, an obvious uh, quadruped. Lots of quadrupeds in the mammalian uh, line. Some votes for three, another quadruped. Uh, a vote for number six, nine. Another vote for six, another vote for three. I think three at the moment is our... Three and nine seem to be uh, in contentious here. Another vote for two. So votes seem to be converging around robots two, three, six, and nine. Anybody want to offer a short uh, summary of why they picked a particular body plan? I see no votes for five or seven. Why not? Feel free to offer an opinion for why you picked a particular robot or why you did not pick a particular robot. Nine looks stable, uh, very sta simple and stable, absolutely. So stability is pretty important here. Simplicity is also probably important. Low stability uh, in seven, okay. Uh, I'll offer a, a, cu a couple more details. You'll notice that the feet of the snake robot in number seven are short cylinders. This robot is only going to be able to move its spine up and down. It cannot twist its spine side to side. So seven was actually designed so that it cannot uh, fall over. The only robot capable of falling over in this case uh, is this robot and our triped over here. The other snake robot, number five, lies on the ground. The fitness function only rewards for speed of travel. It does not reward for energy efficiency. Any other guesses or rationales before we, uh, we see the actual winner? Okay. I'll show you a few more videos. Here's the best neural network evolved for the hexapod. This is robot number six. Again, this is an old experiment, so I apologize for the quality of the videos. Here's the best evolved neural network for the quadruped. So this is a relatively rare gait in quadrupeds where the left legs move in sync and they move in antiphase with the right legs, but it does, it does exist in certain mammalian species. Here's a, a human using uh, crutches kind of. You can see there's a lot of quote unquote effort that the evolutionary algorithm had to put in to keep this robot stable. And it's not actually stable the whole time. You'll notice towards the end of this video, 
This, this neural network is able to maintain stability for quite a while. And then at the end, not so much. Okay, here's uh, robot number seven, the, the sort of upright snake. You'll notice that evolution is starting to discover a particular gait, which we mentioned right at the beginning of our discussion of biomechanics. What is that gait or what is that behavior? Anybody remember? You'll notice there's a bit of a traveling wave. It's not perfect yet, but evolution's getting there. There's a traveling wave along the spine of this robot. Peristalsis, exactly, right? You use peristalsis in your throat muscles to swallow uh, food and gulp air. Anyone wanna change their bets? Speak now, forever hold your peace. Okay. Okay, so uh, six was technically the winner here. Um, you'll notice that the curve for six, shown in bold here, is a little, um, it's a little rougher than the other curves. I didn't quite finish all my 30 runs for robot number six. I did complete the 30 runs for the other nine robots, and I averaged the best fitness across those 30 runs for each of the 10 robots. So I don't have any error bars on here, meaning I, don't, I can't tell you much about the uncertainty uh, of these curves, but you can see that more or less six, two, and three sort of were tied for, for a first place. So let me back up for a moment. Here is uh, six, two, and three. So well done, everybody. Uh, most of you had a guess around two, three, or six, so your intuitions were, were pretty good. You'll notice that, uh, I lost it now, where are we? Oh uh, yeah, okay. Uh, you'll notice there's another cluster here and then down at the bottom is five and seven, which were our two snake robots. Okay, uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about this figure now. Um, this, what you're looking at are 10 different footprint graphs. This is a particular way of plotting the behavior uh, of a robot or an animal. Um, obviously a video is worth a thousand words, but if you don't have recourse to a video, this is a great demonstration statically of how a robot or animal moves. One of the nice things about footprint graphs, as you can probably see, is it very clearly communicates um, whether the gait has a clean cycle or not. Okay, how does a footprint graph work? Well, I've got 10 panels here, and what I'm showing are the footprints left by the 10 different robots when it was controlled by the best, the most fit evolved neural network within the, for that robot. Let's take uh, this particular footprint graph here. Each row in the graph corresponds to one body part that can come into contact with the ground. In the case of robot number one, as you can see here, there are only four body parts that can come in contact with the ground. We evaluate that evolved uh, neural network in the simulator, in this case for 500 time steps. And at each time step, we record whether or not the foot is in contact with the ground. And if that foot or that body part is in contact with the ground, we darken that pixel. If the foot is not in contact with the ground, we do not color in that pixel. Okay, as you remember from the video I showed you for robot number one, the two legs move together, they move in phase with each other, and the two left legs move in anti-phase with the two right legs, anti-phase, right? When the two left legs are furthest forward, the two right legs are furthest backward, uh, and so on. And you can see that pretty clearly in the, you can see that pretty clearly in the footprint graph. You can see that it's not a symmetric gait. Two of the legs spend more time on the ground than the other two. They act as the stance feet more often uh, than, the, than the other side. You'll notice for robot number two, uh, the other quadruped here, there's a very clean oscillation, a very clean gait. Why did five and seven not do so well? Remember that five and seven, five and seven did not do so well. They're the two uh, snake robots. What do the footprint graphs tell us about robots five and seven? Why do you think they're not doing as well?
Here's the footprints produced by uh, the first snake robot using its best controller. Here's the footprint graph for the second snake robot using its best controller. Any ideas? It's a little difficult to see, but uh, yeah, as Andrew says, there's not too much of a pattern. There's a little bit of a pattern, but it's, it's messier than the other ones. For some reason, it is harder for evolution to find a set of synaptic weights for the two snake robots to produce clean peristalsis than it is for evolution to find a good set of synaptic weights for the quadrupeds. Okay. La the last thing we looked at in this paper was, again, to try and understand in a little more detail what. What is it about these different body plans that predicts whether or not it will be easy for evolution to find good gates for them? So in the first case here, I computed the total mass of the 10 robots. So here's robot one, robot four, robot eight, and so on. Each of the body parts has a mass of one. Again, uh, our physics engines are kind of unitless, so it's not clear whether it's one pound or one kilogram. Doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, so basically the number of parts that make up the robot, that's, that's its total mass. You'll notice that the heaviest robot was robot six, which had a total of 41 parts. Uh, you can count them up in, in here. Uh, there should be 41 in there, I think. Uh, and then the lightest one was number one with only 15 parts. Yeah, that's, that seems right. Okay. You'll notice that there is kind of a pattern. So the heavier the robot is, the uh, worse its average performance, the harder it was for evolution to find a gate for it. But mass is not the only explanation because this isn't a perfect downward slope. There are three exceptions here, which are the three winners. Two, three, and six were some of the heaviest robots we looked at in this study. So m total mass alone is not enough to predict whether it will be hard for evolution to work. So uh, six is kind of interesting. It's the heaviest, but also did the best. One of the reasons might be is again, because the body or total mass is not an obstruction. As Descartes taught us, the body is not dirty or the body is not in the way. The body can be exploited. In this case, the total mass of the robot can be exploited to throw the robot's weight forward and presumably help with forward locomotion. Okay, we also looked at the number of points of contact that was possible. So here's the snake robots out here. All 10 of their feet could come into contact with the ground. Here are the three quadrupeds over here, and here's the triped over here. So too few feet is no good because you have to wrestle with stability. That kind of makes sense. Too many feet over here, maybe it's difficult for evolution to discover synaptic weights that orchestrate or coordinate the movement of all those feet. So too many feet is also not so good. Maybe not so surprisingly, uh, an intermediate number of feet is, seems to be the easiest thing for evolution to, to deal with. Okay, La uh, I'm sorry, this is the last thing I wanted to talk about. Um, as I just showed you, uh, all of these robots had exactly the same brain. They had uh, three, in particular, they had three hidden neurons between the sensor neurons and the motor neurons. I then reran all 10 robots, or I did, I re evolved uh, neural networks for all 10 robots, but I expanded the number of hidden nodes from three to five. So basically, I gave them all bigger brains. They all had the same brain, but it was bigger. Evolved the set of synaptic weights in those bigger brains and recorded the average movement of the evolved robots at the end, which corresponds to the dark gray bars you see here. You'll notice that all of the dark gray bars are a little bit higher than the light gray bars, meaning that those additional hidden neurons helped evolution discover faster, faster moving gates 
for those robots, but not always. So uh, agent number 10 out here, the, trip the tripod robot, it didn't help very much. Robot number nine, uh, this guy didn't seem to help very much. But for the two snakes out here, robots uh, five and seven, having a bigger brain helped substantially. So the answer to question number two, do changes to the cognitive architecture. Remember, cognitive architecture means the number of neurons and how they're wired up. Usually the cognitive architecture is fixed by us and we let evolution find the synaptic weights for that architecture. So increasing the architecture definitely helped, but this effect is not the same across robots. It helped more for the snakes than it did for the others. I don't have a good re answer for you about why the larger brains uh, helped the snake robots. Again, um, there's some raw material here for you to think about. Some of you might want to tackle this for parts of this for a final project. What we tried to do in this particular experiment was to bring together many different aspects of embodied cognition. Movement, the body, the brain, evolution, gates, energy, speed, and so on, and look for relationships between these things. Okay, any questions about this before we move on to bipedal locomotion? We've got, uh, we've got 15 minutes left, 20 minutes left, so we'll, we'll uh, start in on lecture 12 now. Okay, so hopefully this one will be, this lecture will be somewhat intuitive because most of you have decades of experience with this particular uh, behavior, but I think you'll find in this lecture there are some aspects of the very familiar sensation of moving on two legs that are not so there. Uh, bipedal locomotion in particular has been the focus uh, of interest for roboticists again for a very long time. Um, one of, uh, long before Big Dog, one of the first early successes in bipedal locomotion, sorry, Big Dog is obviously quadrupedal locomotion, before uh, Atlas, which is uh, Boston Dynamics humanoid robot, there was Honda Asimo. Um, lots of Asimo videos on, on uh, YouTube. Here's one of Asimo running at nine, uh, was it nine kilometers an hour, miles per hour. It's a short video, I'll play it a couple times. What can you tell me, nine kilometers an hour, what can you tell me about Asimo? What can you tell me about Asimo's gait here? It's almost a silly walk. Why? Clearly is not running quite in the way that humans do. What are some of the differences between Asimo's form of running and our form of running? Henry says he squats down to lower the center of mass. Why is he squatting to lower the center of mass? As Logan mentions, you'll notice that the upper body is very stiff. We'll talk about that in a moment. Alex mentions the torso is uh, very upright and vertical instead of angled forward like a human when a human runs. Why the squatting? Uh, Ethan says he looks pretty top heavy, which is probably why he squats. Henry says higher center of mass would be more likely to fall or tilt over. Stability is one of the most difficult things to get right in uh, bipedal robotics. Good, uh, good uh, starting point is to lower the center of mass. Ben says humans swing their arms when running. Why do we swing our arms when we run? You'll notice Asimo does a little bit, but not as much as us. Why do we swing our arms when we run? Again, as Logan mentions, it, it's a balance issue. If you, when you accelerate your swing leg forward, you apply a lot of force and there is momentum that is pulling your leg forward, which pulls the right side of your body forward and which will cause you, because you're on your left foot, your left foot is your stance phase, you will start to rotate about 
your uh, center of mass, you'll start to rotate counterclockwise by swinging your arms in antiphase with your legs. So whatever leg is moving backwards, that same side or ipsilateral uh, arm is pumping forward and vice versa. You're canceling the torque which remember is the rotational force. There is rotational force that is torquing or twisting you clockwise or counterclockwise around your center of mass. You swing your arms in the opposite way to cancel that. By keeping its center of mass low and taking short, fast steps, Asimo is able to cancel or not allow any of that torque to happen in the first place. So it doesn't need additional computation to figure out how to move its arms to, to cancel. It's, a hard, it's hard enough for Asimo to figure out how to move its legs. Does Asimo have a flight phase? Again, we'll see the advantage of watching a moving picture to answer this question. Does Asimo have a flight phase? There's no flight phase. You'll notice that there's always at least one foot on the ground, which means we could actually ask the question, is Asimo statically stable? If Asimo's motors suddenly froze and Asimo suddenly became stationary, would it be statically stable? Maybe, but it's probably moving a little bit too fast, where even if its center of mass is over its polygon of support, its forward momentum would probably cause it to, to fall over. Okay, any legged, any moving animal or robot has to strike a balance between those four features we talked about. What can you tell me about the backpack? Why is Asimo wearing the silver backpack? This is an older video of Asimo. There's another video I saw this morning on YouTube from 2018. Asimo's wearing a slightly smaller backpack in the 2018 version, but it's still a pretty big backpack. What's in the backpack? Uh, yes, exactly. It looks like a cute astronaut. Uh, uh, as Andrew mentioned and M. Birak mentioned, yeah, it's, there's a battery or power supply. So bipedal locomotion, possibly, evolved, but we don't, at least it is for humans, extremely energy efficient, but in Asimo, it's the opposite. Bipedal locomotion is extremely energy inefficient for Asimo because this gate was designed to be very stable. So they maximized stability and they maximized speed and the cost they gave up was energy efficiency. Okay, so they managed to achieve bipedal locomotion, but they struck a pretty extreme trade-off between some of these features. Let's look at another bipedal robot now, which strikes an opposite trade-off. What can you tell me about this robot? Which of the four features is it maximizing and which are the other ones that it's had to sacrifice? There is one of the four features that has clearly been maximized beyond even humans. And the other three have been sacrificed. It is stable. And yes, it's maximizing stability, kind of. It's not that stable, as you can see. There's a human very nearby. It's stable for the few seconds you watch this video. Uh, Ethan and, energy and Lucas have hit on it, right? This is an extremely energy efficient robot. It's even more energetically efficient than humans. Uh, Lucas mentions it has curved feet and... Uh, uh, and Logan has mentioned its legs are built like pendula, right? There's no backpack here. This is an extremely energy efficient robot. We'll talk about how it achieves this energy efficiency in a moment. The curved feet is part of it. You'll notice this robot has no backpack. What else doesn't it have? 
This is, almo this is almost in the spirit of the minimal cognition experiments. It's a pretty minimal robot. What else is it lacking other than a backpack? A head. It's got no head. There's no cords. There's a pretty good hint. If it's missing a cord and it's missing a backpack, it's probably missing a battery. There's no power source. So if there's no power source, what else must it be missing? No head, no, br no brain, no brain, no motors, no computers, no circuits, no sensors. This is a purely mechanical device. This is, uh, this is the passive dynamic walker. It is purely mechanical. It is almost infinitely energy efficient. It is not using ener any energy of its own. How is it able to move? Physics students that are on the call here, what is, this, what is the trick that this mechanical device is performing to allow it to get from point A to point B? Inertia, it's part of it. Where is, the, where is the energy here? It's not coming from the robot, but there has to be some energy. This thing is moving from point A to point B. What's, what's happening? You might have to recall your high school physics here. What energy is available to this robot? Logan's got one piece of it. There's potential energy. Lucas asks, is it downhill? It's hard to tell from this video. The robot is walking down a very slightly declined plane. So by putting the robot at the top, by putting the robot at the top of this declined plane, uh, there is some potential energy available. And the passive mechanics of this machine translates that potential energy into kinetic uh, energy. As Rachel mentions, there's momentum here. So the robot is also exploiting, uh, is passively exploiting, right? There's no brain, so it's not doing it uh, intentionally, but it is exploiting inertia and momentum to efficiently translate the potential energy available to it into kinetic energy. Missy asks, is the potential energy from each step being recycled by the spring at each step? Are there springs in the feet? Great observation. Um, there's many more videos of the passive dynamic walker. You'll notice there are some springs in the ankles uh, as well. That allow, And springs allow temporary storage and then release of energy a short time later. The robot is also designed very carefully to exploit that. Uh, you'll remember when we talked about the gantry robot from the University of Sussex in the UK and we looked at the, the brain of that robot, there was no triangle and rectangle uh, recognition component. I told you at that time that that neural network was one of the best examples of embodied cognition. This is the second best example uh, of embodied cognition. The passive dynamic walker that you see here is often considered the mascot of embodied cognition. Nothing demonstrates how important the body can be than the passive dynamic walker because it is all body and no brain. It is in some sense an anti-Cartesian device. It is designed to militate against the idea that the body is bad or a hindrance to intelligence. Clearly, the body is often the best canvas on which to paint cognition. It is the base, the best foundation on which to build uh, other forms of intelligence. Okay, that's the passive dynamic walker, but uh, the price that the passive dynamic er, uh, makes by being energy efficient is it is extremely non-robust. Remember, robustness is one of these other features of, uh, of locomotion. Robustness is the range of environments in which you can move. The robustness of this robot is extremely narrow. It is increasing, it is incredibly fragile. This machine can only walk down a declined plane with a declination of three degrees. Any other environment, it'll just simply fall over. Uh, 
Uh, a team from the Netherlands took the idea of the passive dynamic walker and added in uh, added in a motor. So there's now a little bit of power being supplied by the machine to allow it to walk on flat ground. So they have widened the range of environments in which the robot can move and they have decreased its energy efficiency a little bit, but it is still extremely, it is still extremely energy efficient. It is known as a hybrid dynamic walker. It's a little difficult to see in this video. I think I'll just have to describe it to you. I'll play it again once I describe it. Um, when one of the legs is behind the robot, that foot is still on the ground behind the robot. The moment that foot lifts and goes from stance to flight phase, at that moment, the motor gives a pulse of energy, gives a pulse of torque. It, try, it twists the leg, that leg for a short period of time and then the motor shuts off again. So it starts by pushing the foot forward. You might notice that you do this as well. When your foot leaves the ground behind you during walking, you tense your muscles a little bit to help with the forward swing of your swing leg, which has now become a pendulum. And then your muscles turn off in the same way in the in the hybrid dynamic walker, the motor also turns off. So the motor here is not continuously applying torque like it does in the case of Asimo or Big Dog. This muscle is, uh, the motor is turning on and off, on and off, on and off. Still very energy efficient, but a slightly broader range of environments. Okay, a couple more points about passive dynamic uh, walking. You can actually make extremely simple things that do this. There are toys that passively dynamic walk. Uh, here's somebody that made a passive dynamic walker uh, out of paper. You can try making one of these yourself. And finally, here's someone who discovered a passive dynamic walker in the wild. I don't know if we would consider this a robot, uh, but it is certainly uh, exhibiting some form of locomotion. You'll notice this video runs for over three minutes. Takes a while, uh, but this uh, ladder eventually gets to street level. Okay. We've got one minute left. I think uh, this is a good place to pause for today before we look at uh, the evolution of bipedal locomotion in robots. Uh, you have a quiz uh, due tonight. You're working on assignment eight. I forgot to tape the first 10 minutes of this lecture. My apologies. We'll see you all back here on Thursday and have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye, everyone.